Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our Seda Tech Talk series. Um, yeah, so for today's talk, uh, we are having a very interesting talk uh, from uh, on machine learning security from uh, Professor Padis Batista Bijo, uh, and he's very very well known in this area. So I hand it over to you, Batista. Thank you, thank you, Juan, and thank you to all the CEDAR organization for uh, for setting this up. Um, as you see, the title of the talk is uh, Machine Learning Security, and I will try to summarize a bit some of the lessons learned and, and some of the future challenges at the end of the talk, uh, which we so which is what I think uh, of this all field. Um, and in case that after you have any questions, just then we don't have main, maybe time to address all of them, feel free to send me an email or reach out to me on, on Twitter or whatever kind of uh, um, means of communication you, you, you think it's, it's uh, feasible for this. Um, so as you know, AI has, has been you know, successful in many cases. We have many examples in computer vision, speech recognition, cybersecurity, healthcare, but especially after the advent of deep learning, uh, it seems really that these kind of technologies uh, have been started working. Uh, if, if you think to speech recognition, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, it was not very helpful. But nowadays, you can talk with your mobile phone. You can you can you know uh, um, have computer vision algorithms that have really good performances and so on and so forth. And so people started also thinking that these machines can learn like humans do. But of course, this is not the case. And um, what I call the elephant in the room here is the presence of uh, adversarial examples. And I'm sure that many of you have heard about them. Um, quite often now. And essentially what you can show is that given an image, for example, which is or any other kind of data, but let, let's consider images for the sake of visibility here. Uh, you just take one image, you, you send it to your deep learning algorithm, and then you get it classified correctly. Okay, so here you have a school bus, which is correctly classified. And the algorithm in this case says, that it is confident that this image contains a school bus with 94%. Okay, this is like the probability that is outputted by, by the model. Now, what you can do, and what I will discuss in the first five, six slides in the, in the today, is how to craft uh, a special kind of noise that can be added to the image. And, and this is like modifying every pixel by a very small amount. So it's almost imperceptible to the human eyes unless you zoom in a lot uh, to, to spot it. But then if you consider the modified image that you see on the right, and now you process this again with your deep learning algorithm, you get that this is misclassified as an ostrich with uh, maybe 97%. Okay, so this is what is called an adversarial example. Um, and examples of this kind have been shown in many different applications. So we have, Examples for face recognition, as you see here, people have fabricated eyeglass frames to impersonate Hollywood celebrities, for example. You see here that uh, Lujo Bauer is impersonating Mila Jovovich, according to the algorithm. Um, you can camouflage stop signs to have the uh, recognition algorithm think that they are speed limits by just applying some stickers. Again, here, the kind of perturbation that you see uh, both for the eyeglass frames and the stickers is not random, but it's crafted with, with a special um, technique. We have examples on the audio domain. So you see here Carlini, Nicolas Carlini and David Wagner, they've shown that you can actually add a small uh, perturbation background noise to the um, speech signal. And then the text to speech transcription, uh, the speech to text, sorry, uh, transcription mechanism just uh, writes a wrong sentence, just transcribes the, the wrong, a wrong sentence, which is de defined or selected by the attacker, while humans can still perceive the original uh, audio. And applications, we have done a lot of work also to show that this can be a problem also when you use machine learning for malware detection. So there are ways in which you can obfuscate the malicious content uh, so that the classifier eventually thinks that the sample is benign. Okay, so we have countless applications in uh, or the existence of adversarial examples have been shown in many different applications. So not only on images, and um, 
the main intuition behind them is that the noise that you craft, this perturbation that you add, is a function of the model that you are attacking. In particular, if you look back in uh, 2012, 2013, where um, our group was working on uh, trying to bypass malware detectors that were based on machine learning, not deep learning techniques yet, but standard machine learning techniques, like again, new neural nets and, and support vector machines, for instance. So the idea that we had was to formalize the problem of bypassing the model as an optimization problem. So as you see here, you have, for example, a malicious instance, which can be a spam email or a, mal or a malware sample. And this G of X is basically the support that the classifier gives to the uh, decision, okay? So you can think it as like the probability output of being malicious in this case. So when you see the red region, the classifier thinks that the sample is really malicious. If you look at the benign part, this is corresponding to the blue area, okay? And then in between, you have this decision boundary. This is a simplified view, but it is actually how the classification problem works. So the classifier has to make, it, has to make a decision whether the sample is legitimate or malicious, okay? So you start from an X here. So you have a spam email and you want to have it misclassified as benign. So what, what, what are you gonna do? Um, spammers normally modify the text at random. They try to obfuscate some words or they try to add some, some benign words. Uh, what we had in mind was, what if instead of picking these words and doing these changes at random, we just you know, tune them against the specific classifier. So what we want to do is like minimize the output of the classifier. So this probability of malicious, we wanna decrease it so that the sample becomes benign. And we want to do it by manipulating the sample X. So the content of the spam email, for instance. Of course, uh, the problem has some constraints because we still want that the spam email uh, conveys the message to the human. So I cannot delete the spam message and write a benign email. Okay, I cannot do unbounded perturbation here. But I want to modify, for example, few words or add some other benign words such that the message is consistent. Okay, and in some cases, you can model this as an LP norm constraint. For example, if you have a um, spam detector that just checks presence or absence of words, and you measure the distance between these two feature vectors, the M in distance will just be the number of words that you change. Okay, so you can bound these in a very simple way. And it turns out that within this specific manipulation or perturbation budget, you have to find a sample that is misclassified, uh, so it's classified as benign. Now, this is an optimization problem. It's nonlinear and, and it's constrained. The simplest thing you can do if the classifier is differentiable is to use gradient descent, okay? So you just take an off-the-shelf optimizer for gradient descent, you just run it, you project the point back into the feasible domain when it uh, tries to violate it. And eventually you find a modified point X prime, which still contains a message, which is understandable by humans, but uh, this time is classified as benign with a very high confidence in this case. Um, and this can be done for many, many classifiers, as I said, neural networks, even, even if not deep, uh, support vector machines and many others. And the reason is that many of these classifiers are differentiable because you can train them using gradient descent. Okay, so that's, you exploit the same fact uh, actually to attack them. So the overall idea of these attacks is to craft a perturbation which is guided by the gradient of the model. Okay, just to make it again simpler, just consider the image we had before, the school bus, this is correctly classified. Then if you compute the gradient of, of this model from the output back to the input, what you get is, the image, is an image that has the same uh, shape, the same size of the input image. Okay, and this is, this is just your noise mask. Then you add it to your input image, you iterate some, some time for some time, and then you have the images misclassified as something different, like an ostrich. Okay, so the, the overall idea of all these attacks is just to compute a perturbation which is aligned with the gradient of the model, okay? The gradient of the outputs with respect to the input. So that's all you need to know to, to fool the models. Um, and of course, like we had this 
very early idea of using gradients to craft both what we call evasion and poisoning attacks. But then this became super pop this became super popular after um, Young Goodfellow, Christian Zajedi, and the team from Google Brain published the, the very popular uh, paper, Intriguing Properties of Neural Networks, where they show essentially the same problem for deep models, for deep learning models in computer vision. Okay, so the community was shocked by the fact that uh, you can actually craft this very small perturbation to flip the prediction of, of state-of-the-art models. And so th from there, since then, we had this, uh, we've seen this huge explosion of papers. Now people trying to propose defenses to patch the problem, other people showing that, other researchers showing that these defenses were not working and so on and so forth. Okay, so the, the, the field is literally boomed and it's not only about adversarial examples so it's not only about adversarial examples or attacks that are called poisoning attacks where you where we, we assume that the attacker can modify the training data but there are again plenty of other attack scenarios that we can uh, that one can exploit now for the sake of time i will just focus on uh, evasion attacks as the ones that i showed so where we assume that the model is trained on clean data and it's deployed. And then what the attacker can do is manipulate their test samples to bypass detection. Okay, so that we have a malware sample, we want the antivirus to misclassify it as, a, as benign. That's the kind of setup. In the other attacks, you can do many more, many more things, like if you can poison the model. So if you can add training data, which is compromised while the model is retrained, for instance, then you can create backdoors in the model. You can degrade the accuracy on certain classes. You can do a lot of stuff, a lot of bad stuff, okay? And then there is all a bunch of attacks, which is again, related to privacy leaks. Um, you can, for instance, query a model, which is trained and provide as a service to copy the model. This is called model stealing. You can infer private information about the training data using membership inference attacks or using model inversion to reconstruct even some of the training samples. But I mean, these, these, I'm just mentioning this for the sake of completeness, but we will go, we will consider only evasion attacks in this talk. Okay. Um, if you are interested in knowing more about this kind of taxonomy that I just showed, you can check my this old paper, now old paper that I wrote uh, together with Fabio Rolli back in 2018, where I gave like, we gave like the, the kind of modeling that you can use to, to envision all potential attacks against machine learning models. And this can be, and this can be then completed with the attacks that have been considered from 2018 onwards, like the slide that I showed before. Um, if you are specifically interested in poisoning attacks, you can also refer to this other paper. Sorry for the shameless uh, advertisement here. But uh, in this other one, we like surveyed 200 papers that only deal with poisoning attacks and it's just published. So this is like very fresh. So if you want to keep like uh, a good step into the state of the art for poisoning attacks and defenses, you can refer to this, to, to this paper, okay? All right, so <clears throat> now the question is, given that we have all these problems uh, with machine learning and AI models, what can we do to make them more secure or more robust? Um, so the, the idea that I have in, in, in a kind of sense, uh, also from a more practical perspective, um, I'm sure you heard about ML operations. Right? So the idea that we can have a similar cycle like we have for development operation for classical software, we, there is a new trend where, where engineers and, and, and data scientists are trying to automate the deployment process of machine learning models, okay? Like using a standard pipelines to ship new models to the, to the production line and to the users. So here are the main steps of this pipeline, okay? So imagine that you prepare your data, you train the model, you package, you validate with some tests. This means you have a new model that you retrain on fresh data, before putting it into production, what you do is you test if the accuracy is, uh, is good enough, right? So you have some, or if the performance, if the speed, inference speed, all these metrics that you can have, they, they pass the tests, right? If the tests are passed, then you deploy the model, and then you have all the monitoring phase, where you check, for instance, if your model is provided as a service, 
if it's working correctly, that nobody is trying to abuse it, like you know, trying to do a denial of service or something like that. So there is all this monitoring stuff that also ensures that the servers are up and running, that the models uh, work correctly, and so on and so forth. This is like the kind of pipeline. Um, what I'm advocating here is that uh, the security component is missing, okay? So there's no robustness embedded into this MLOps uh, cycle. And, and to add robustness or security to these pipelines, we actually need to look at three pillars, in my opinion, and they are protection, which happens at training time. So you can use actually modified algorithms, modified learning algorithms, which are intrinsically more robust to specific kinds of perturbation. Okay, so let's say you do some threat modeling, there is some threats that you can envision against your system, and then you can try to anticipate them by making a more robust model at training time. Then there is the testing part, where the idea is that you don't, you not just test the standard accuracy of the model or the F1 score or whatever, but you wanna look how the model performs in out of distribution scenarios or against specific attacks that, that we know may, may happen in practice. And finally, you have the monitoring part where you can also have some detection modules that aim to stop or detect specific inputs which might be problematic. Okay, like here in standard applications, you have, for example, if you have a computer vision system and someone is just um, uh, you know, occluding the camera, then an alert is raised. Here, you can imagine something similar, but what we want to detect is not just trivial cases, but cases which are a bit subtler, like samples that we know are out of distribution or can be perturbed in an adversarial manner. Okay, so that's the how to protect the monitoring part in a sense. So I will just try to go pillar by pillar here and discuss a bit some of the problems that each of these pillars have and what we can do about it. And let me start with security testing, um, which means how do I simulate attacks against my model? And how, I, how can I be, in a sense, uh, sure that my evaluation is reliable enough? Okay. So here I just like identify three main problems. One is how to make the evaluation faster and more reliable. Um, how, uh, and how to debug it in case we have problems. And then the last, the last part, the yellow circle here represents the fact that <clears throat> not all application domains are like images where you can take you know, the gradient of the model, add the noise to the input data, and then you have a new sample. The notion of adding noise to malware is very different uh, from the uh, definition of adding noise to images. Okay, so we need to consider a broader spectrum of, of, of cases and not just additive noise, uh, which can simply be added to the inputs. So the, the real world is much more complex than this. So regarding the first <clears throat> point, um, I will just discuss the case, you know, computer vision, which is the more mature one for uh, adversarial robustness evaluations. And here there is a benchmark, which is quite popular, which is called robust bench, where Francesco Croce and his colleagues, um, what they do is that they collect models claim to be robust by uh, you know, different authors and re-evaluate them with a suite of attacks, which is called auto attack. Okay, this is a combination of um, an ensemble of attacks that have some properties. The nice thing is that this is easy to tune somehow because they all internally, this does all the hyperparameter optimization in a sense. And so the evaluation that you get is quite reliable. Uh, of course, <clears throat> the problem is that models are just evaluated for a fixed perturbation budget. In this case that you see here, this is the data set used, CIFAR 10, and the constraint that you have on the perturbation is that each pixel in each image can be modified by just plus minus eight over 255. Okay, so that's the kind of perturbation model that you have. Of course, um, it's just a simplification, right? Because you can say, why I modify eight pixels and not, you know, the gray level, the, the color value, why not 10 or 20 or 15? Okay, so it's just an arbitrary number. Um, and the other drawback is that this benchmark is a bit uh, computationally demanding to run because you have to run four attacks and combine the outputs somehow. <clears throat> so can we do any better than this? This is like ongoing work that we have. 
Um, the idea that we have is that we can use attacks that are not just evaluating robustness at a fixed perturbation budget, but they also try to optimize the, the perturbation budget. So like, what's the minimum perturbation budget that the attacker needs to evade detection or to flip the label of the, of the sample, okay? If, if you can do this, then you can plot the, what we call the complete security evaluation curve. So I can show you robust accuracy, how we decreases for you know, all possible values of perturbation sites without rerunning the attacks over and over, basically, for different budgets. Um, and recently, we have proposed one of these attacks with the idea of crafting an attack which is very efficient and also that finds the minimum perturbation required to um, evade detection. The idea is always to look at the gradient. So we start from a point, we follow the gradient for a given budget. And if the attack doesn't evade the, the model, so the sample is not classified as something different, then what we do is like we change the perturbation budget. We allocate a new budget, and then again, we run the attack for some iterations until we find a point that evades detection. If it evades detection, then we try to shrink the budget because we want to find you know, the point which is the minimum distance with respect to the first one, to the source one. And so these attacks, this attack eventually finds uh, the minimum perturbation required uh, to have the sample misclassified as something different. It's easy to tune, it works for different norms. This is also another advantage that is not, you know, uh, specialized for a given perturbation model, but you can use different kinds of perturbations running from sparse attacks to dense attacks. So sparse attack means if you use sparse norms, L0 and L1, the attack is gonna modify only a few features by a large amount, like I'm just changing five, 10 pixels. Okay, but in a visible manner. If you consider dense perturbations like L2 or L infinity, what you're going to do is modify all the pixels by a small amount so that the perturbation may be less noticeable by, by a human uh, that looks at it. But in some applications, you know, you may need different kinds of uh, perturbation models. Um, and then, of course, we compare it with state of the art attacks and you show that uh, it converges faster and it more or less retrieves the same adversarial examples, but using <clears throat> uh, less iterations overall. So that's the thing. And we are still working to improve it and create another kind of benchmark where we can see the full curve, the full evaluation curve. So this is something you can do to you know, make the evaluation faster and a bit more informative than the current models that we have, the current benchmarks. <clears throat> another big problem is how do we ensure that this evaluation is reliable enough, right? Because when you have, a, the problem is, I have a given perturbation budget, for instance, and if the attack finds an adversarial example within this, within the feasible domain, within this, within this budget, then I can say, okay, the algorithm is vulnerable. But if the attack doesn't find any adversarial example in this, within this budget, it doesn't mean that no adversarial example exists in this region. Okay, it's just that my algorithm is not able to find it. So if you wanted to, you know, have the full mathematical guarantee, the formal requirement, the formal guarantee that there is no adversarial example within this perturbation budget, then you have to use that formal verification. So ensure that all possible perturbations of your sample within the given budget are just classified consistently by the model. Of course, this only works for simple cases and scaling this up is problematic. So most of the evaluations are still done in an empirical way. We run gradient descent, we optimize our attacks using gradients, and then we check what the accuracy or robust accuracy of the model is. So that's most of the evaluation what they do. The problem is that many of the evaluations were done wrongly, okay? So eventually they overestimate the robustness of their methods. For example, here you have many defense papers on top of the line. We have distillation, magnet, and so on, and they all overestimated robustness. So this means they claimed, like we have solved the problem of adversarial example, and specifically distillation here, the authors were saying, this model is robust 99% to adversarial examples crafted with this budget. 
on this data set. Okay. The same for the others, up to the point that where you see the red crosses, people, other people have attacked this model in a smarter way and showed that there is a better algorithm that finds adversarial examples and breaks their defense. Okay, so they eventually showed that the real robust accuracy of these defenses was close to zero. Okay, so from 90 to zero. And in, in many other cases, you have like that you go from 80 or 70 or 60 to 40, 20, 10. So just, you know, it means that your defense doesn't work at all. And, and this was like going on an arms race because then uh, these people produce some guidelines on what you should do when you evaluate robustness in an empirical way. And people have started again, proposing defenses over and over. And eventually they were broken with the same tricks of before. Okay, so it seems that there is a problem in the community because people are not able to evaluate defenses properly because this requires a lot of um, tuning of the attacks and understanding really how the defense works and so on. So you need to have a lot of skills <laughs> to understand how to evaluate robustness in a correct way. So how do we like try to mitigate this problem or solve it? In software, when you have bugs, what you do, you have debug tools, right? To find the bugs, you have automated tools that help you spot the problems. And, and this is exactly the idea we, we proposed in one of the latest papers. Um, what we came up with was, let's propose some quantitative metrics. So some indicators that spot, that can spot problems within robustness evaluations. So when you run your attack algorithm, we check if there is any problem when the attack is optimized, okay? Here you have many causes of failure, many uh, metrics that we use to measure them and many solutions, okay? So there's one-to-one -one mapping from failure to the kind of remedy remediation that one can use. Just for, to give an intuition to you, uh, there are, one of these problems is that many defenses have what is called obfuscated gradients. So essentially the gradient signal from the model is noisy. And then it's clear that if you run an attack or an optimization based process, which is based on gradients, you don't get any useful information out of it. Okay, so the attack is just not able to be optimized because the gradient is not informative. Okay, so these are ex different examples, but you see here failure number two is stochastic gradients. It means that the model has some random component and the gradient is noisy. So what you can do to overcome this problem is to use what is called expectation over transformation. So essentially you sample nearby your point and you average the gradient. If you use the average gradient, instead of using you know, one gradient, uh, one random gradient produced by the model, well, you can have that your loss. So when you optimize the attack, your loss goes down correctly. And when you see here, the zero line means that if I go below it, I found an adversarial example. You see that here adversarial examples are fine, are found. Okay, so whereas if you go with a classic attack, you just oscillate on top and, and you are not optimizing anything. So this is one thing we're looking at to debug this um, optimization of attacks. F3 is even easier to, to, to understand. So there are attacks that are optimized and they just return the last point. Okay, so you, you optimize it for 100 iterations and you just return the last point. Sometimes you have a behavior that the attack is just oscillating at the end or the loss goes up again if the function is noisy somehow. So in this case, the simple patch, if this happens, is just to go back in your, your look at the whole descent path of your algorithm, of your attack, and pick the best point. So the point that has the minimum loss along the path. Now, if you do that, many defenses already go from 80% to 50% accuracy when you test them against attacks. Okay, so it's just a subtle error that many people do because they just reuse open source libraries which have this bug inside, and this can be patched. And then there are many other cases like non-converging attacks. So there are evaluations where you run the attack only for 10 or 20 iterations. So the loss is just going down, but it's just stopped early, too early to find an adversarial example. If you run it for a hundred or a thousand iterations, then you find the adversarial example. So here it's just that people are not patient enough to run the algorithm for the 
you know, proper amount of time and iterations. Um, and then I have just an example here of some defenses. So these are defenses that are known to be broken and they claim this robust accuracy in their paper. Okay, so 58%, 94%, and so on and so forth. You can use the indicators of failure actually to quantify when you have problems. So here, some of the indicators fail, and then what you need to do is just follow a protocol to patch the evaluation. So one by one, you can like switch off the indicator by applying a patch or a mitigation. And you see that if you do, if you follow the process, you go from 58 to six, 94 to zero, and so on and so forth. So the defenses are actually broken, but at least you have a tool that can guide you through, the, to, through doing, let's say, a, reliable, a more reliable evaluation, okay? So that was the um, kind of second contribution that we put in this security testing part. The last one is more about um, facing the problem that not all the perturbations can be added to the inputs, okay? That this plus operator, you don't have it for all the kind of data in the real world. Like if you consider malware, it doesn't mean anything to add bytes together, okay? Bytes are like qualitative features like red, green, blue. They, they, they have the same meaning, right? It's not, um, they, they have not <clears throat> a numerical value, which is meaningful, okay? It's not the number, you cannot represent them as numbers. So you need to do something different. In particular here, it means you cannot just optimize the attack by following the gradient, but at some point, if you optimize something in the feature space, let's say, which is, what is the input to your model, then you have somehow to go back to craft the perturbation in the real world or in the problem space. Okay, so <clears throat> specifically, for example, for, uh, for, for malware samples, there are classifiers that, starts, that start from looking at the bytes, then they map the bytes into an embedding space, like what happens with uh, words typically. <clears throat> there is word to vec, you take words, you map them in a ve vector space, where ideally um, bytes or words that have a similar uh, meaning, so a similar semantics, they are grouped together, okay? And from this space onwards, you can use deep learning or whatever you want, okay? Now it becomes a machine learning problem. So you can optimize the, the attack on this embedding, up to this embedding space where you can retrieve gradients, but then from this embedding space, you need to go back and recompute the actual bytes that you need to modify in the program. Um, so to, to make this on, uh, on Windows malware, what we did was to consider many different transformations that one can apply to the PE format. Okay, so to executable formats, there are many ways in which you can create space and add or inject bytes without touching the other bytes. Okay, that's the easiest thing you can do to avoid <clears throat> compromising the malware functionality. So we want that the malware still works, of course. And so here there are many points where you can manipulate or inject bytes in the program without corrupting its execution. Now, the thing is, which kind of bytes should I add in this space that I just created, where you can select these bytes by optimizing the noise against the model, okay? And then you create this noise, this perturbation in the embedding space, in the feature space, and then you project back onto the closest byte or something like that. Uh, it's not so complex, okay? It, mean, it, it seems more complex as I explain it, but in practice it's much easier for this specific case. And so you can again craft <clears throat> gradient-based attacks against many different models that learn directly from bytes or from their embeddings. And as you see, all of them are like vulnerable to this specific noise injection, okay? So of course these, assumes that we can access the model because to compute the gradient, you need to have white box access to the model, know the architecture, the parameters and so on. But you can also do it in a black box fa fashion. So the idea here is that instead of optimizing, let's say byte by byte, what we want to add to, to the malware samples, we just pick the content from the benign files. So we have a bunch of benign files like Windows programs. We took some chunks, and we just optimize the percentage of each file, you know, the, the, how much content we need to take from each chunk. And then we just put it in the empty space that we carved in the executable file. The selection of these fractions from each file can be optimized in a black box manner. It means 
We start from a sample, we pick random content from the benign samples, and we query the model. And then we query it many times and we refine the selection of the content. And you know, as the score of the model goes down. So that's the how it works. We did it with the genetic algorithm. Um, and of course, there is a trade-off between how much content you inject and the number of iterations that you that you can do. Like, because if I can query the model many, many times, then I can somehow prune my adversarial payload and make it smaller and smaller and smaller while keeping the same evasion rate. So if you look at this, this is like reflected in these curves. So we attack two models. And you see here, this is the number of bytes that we add to each malware taken from benign samples. <clears throat> and as you see, as the number of queries increases, these curves approaches the origin, which means I can evade the model because your detection rate gets smaller. So I evade more and more with a smaller and smaller payload size. Okay, so eventually for a sufficient number of queries, you can really bypass the model with a small payload. And of course, uh, we tested this with machine learning models and it worked very well. Even if you attack um, differentiable models or also models that are non-differentiable so that you don't have gradients for them, right? Because if you take decision trees like this one, this amber model, this is using decision trees on top of handcrafted features. So there's no gradient that can be exploited uh, in this case. Still, the attack works very well. <clears throat> now, the thing is that we didn't expect uh, this attack to work against real antiviruses, right? Because we are not obfuscating the malicious content. We are just adding benign content. So if, if the antivirus is using something like a signature that is really hooked to the vulnerability that the malware is exploiting, then you should be able to detect it. However, we test these on virus total, as you see on, on different antiviruses, and many of them uh, we found that they are vulnerable to this kind, even to this simple attack where we inject benign content to each malware. Um, as you see here, the first antivirus was able to detect 93% of all the malware samples that we tested. Uh, if you just add random input, co ra random content, random bytes to the files, you bypass it with some you know, fraction. This was just a sanity check for uh, simple signatures, like you compute the hash of the file or something like that, okay? So still with that, with a little bit of randomization, you bypass it. But if you really optimize the attack with our method, so you take the content from benign files, you add it, then you see that the detection rate drops by 60%, okay? And more or less, you have the same behavior for other antiviruses. This probably also tells us that um, many of these algorithms are used or are based on machine learning models, which are you know, just trained and, and crafted uh, with the usual process. So they are intrinsically vulnerable to any kind of malicious manipulations that you can perform. <clears throat> okay. Um, then I have a part where I talk about uh, offline detection. So what you can do before shipping the model uh, to improve robustness. And here, the main idea is basically to retrain on attacks, okay? So if you, if you can simulate the attacks at, at, you know, in the testing process, you can also simulate them during training. So you can actually model the process at training time and build a more robust model, okay? I'm not gonna describe this in detail, um, but this is something we exploited in the context of Android malware detection. And actually, the nice thing is that you don't even need to retrain and use this co computational costly procedure, but you just um, you just need to use a specific regularization term in your in your model. In this case, Android classification, if you know Drebin, it's essentially mapped as a is, is faced as a text classification problem where each permission, API call, and so on, is considered like a word in a text. And you have zero, one to denote whether this is present or not in the application file. Once you do this, you can train a model and then you know, uh, learn to distinguish between legitimate and malicious. If you consider the, classic, the classical Drebin version, which uses support vector machine, and you attack it by adding content again to the APK, so you can fake some API calls, 
you can add fake permissions like the application uses the camera even if it doesn't okay this doesn't compromise the application functionality but you can inject features that can be used to fool detection and you see that adding five to 15 features you can essentially uh, evade the model if you ensemble different models you get some more robustness like as you see here the blue card is a bit better but still it's easy to evade and if you use like this idea of retraining but using a specific regularizer somehow so you use the, the optimal classifier for this case what you get is the red lines okay and this is much more robust than the previous cases as you see here you need more than 50 to 100 features to be injected to bypass detection um, there's nothing let's say magic here there's no magic the reason is that if you use the standard svm what happens is that you have few features that take a very large weight because they are very discriminant of some families like of malware or benign okay so if i just add features that are strongly characterizing the benign class, then this, the output score of the SVM drops very quickly. And then it's easy to evade with few changes. If you use this specific regularizer, uh, like this infinity norm penalty on the weights, then what happens is that the weight of the model, the weights are bounded, okay? They cannot be exceed some values. And so the impact of each modification that the attack can do is bounded. And therefore, at the end of the day, the attacker needs to manipulate more and more features to um, bypass the classification algorithm. So that's, that's one example of how you can make something more robust at training time. Um, you can skip this one. The overall idea is that basically you are pushing the decision boundary away from the input samples in, in, in the training process, okay? Then if you want, we can discuss more about this. Um, and then I have some other examples of detectors. So things that you can build at training time, but then you can use when, when the model is monitored, like a test time to detect anomalous inputs. Okay, so the overall idea of these techniques is that we do not force the classifier to make a decision for each point, each possible input, like it's, it's normally happening. Okay, so if you take any machine learning model, you train it, you have 10 classes, the model is always predicting the input data within these 10 classes in, in one of them, okay? The, what a detector gives you is the possibility of rejecting some samples, okay? The possibility, to, the, the classifier in this case can say, um, for this sample, I don't want to make any decision. I don't know, okay? I cannot classify it reliably. And so the idea is that you can have an additional class where you try to classify anomalous inputs in like garbage or adversarial examples, out of distribution elements and so on and so forth. And we had a very simple idea to do this. So to detect anomalies with respect to the training data. And the idea was to look at some of the inner representations of the neural network and then check you know, the behavior of the samples within these specific representations trying to spot anomalies. So things that are far away from the training samples. Uh, this is one potential approach, which I have to say uh, can be bypassed if you have like, let's say a smart attacker, but if you have perturbations in the physical world, like the eyeglass frames, or maybe also the modified traffic signs, then this can be something that works uh, to detect these per perturbations, okay? Because in the physical world, you need to have much more visible perturbations, which are bounded to specific points in the in parts of the image and so on. You cannot have like that every pixel is changed by plus minus eight or 10. Okay, so the, the, this is not doable in the physical world. <clears throat> so this gives some hope against physical attacks. And there are other cases um, where you can do similar things. For example, if you have um, external domain knowledge, you can also combine these with learning from data to detect to detect um, anomalous samples. So let me just make a very simple example here. Let's say I have a classifier that classifies animals. And then I also have some um, logical constraints, some, some other additional attributes. For example, if my classifier says, as the main classes, I have a zebra in this image, then I will check the attributes 
and ensure that the S stripes, it's active, right? Because if it's a zebra, it has to have stripes. So you can have this kind of um, sanity checks um, that you can use to reject inconsistent predictions. So if, if my model is saying this is a zebra, but it has no stripes, then probably it was maybe, I don't know, some other animal that was uh, modified to look like a zebra, right? or adding these malicious perturbations. And again, this can be done in a very, so you can encode domain knowledge in a very elegant way in the learning process. All these logical formulas can be translated into a loss function, which can be optimized. And then you have some more robustness guarantees. But again, this only works in very specific conditions. The reality is that there's no actual defense that works very well against super targeted uh, perturbations or attacks to your model. So what's next? <clears throat> this is my last slide. Okay, because I've been talking about attacks based on gradients or using some very complex optimization process to bypass a model. But in reality, we don't see any of these. Okay, there's a lot of people claiming that some of these examples, some of these attacks occur in practice. But my feeling is that so far, attackers are not using gradients to uh, bypass the models. Uh, and they're using much trivial attacks uh, just because bypassing current system is much easier than what we are studying at this level. Okay, so people are not, uh, the attackers are not yet at the point that they need to exploit really the machine learning component to, to bypass the system. And so the question is, what do we do with all these uh, tons of papers that have been published throughout the last 10, 15 years? Um, are they useful to solve any current problem of machine learning systems, or we can just you know, throw them uh, out of the window? Well, my idea is that, so my question to the say, research community is, can we use any of these techniques like adversarial training or these detection systems or you know, any kind of lessons that, that we learned from what we've been doing in the last uh, decade? Is anything that we did in this context, like to defend against the very worst case, which is a bit uh, not practical, can we use any of these techniques to improve or to take on some of the current challenges that emerge from industry? So like, how can we improve robustness or accuracy over time? Okay, because if you take a malware detector, for instance, then you see you deploy it. After two months, you have to retrain it. Is there anything we can do to do, you know, maybe less retraining rounds or ensure that we have the system stays accurate for longer or something like that? So is there anything coming from all this literature of adversarial machine learning useful to this extent? Or again, can we detect out of distribution samples in a more reliable manner, okay? Because at the moment you cannot even tell whether a sample that you're classifying belongs to the training distribution or not. This is again, a problem that is not, is not solved nowadays. So if I train my self-driving car on some data that I collected and then I you know, uh, let it drive in the wild, I cannot say if the images that this is processing are reliably classified or not. I don't know if they are part of the training distribution or not. Um, can we use anything of, of this field to improve maintainability and interpretability of the model in general? So to you know, improve the update procedures or even learn from noisy or incomplete label data sets. Again, here for malware detection, you never have the real ground truth for all samples and at the current time. So you're gonna have it maybe later in time, you see the real label after two, three months that the malware is, 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 is around. <clears throat> so again, here, does anything we did, for example, in, in the context of poisoning attacks or robust models for poisoning, helpful to take all these other challenges? So this is like my final questions <clears throat> to make this more proactive to solve some of the practical challenges of nowadays. All right. Uh, this is just acknowledging, you know, um, some of the projects that we have in particular, I'm part of uh, the ELSA network. This is like an European project. We promote a network of excellence around uh, Europe for AI safety and robustness, as well as fairness and the other, you know, trustworthy pillars. So if, if you're interested, just reach, reach out to me or just have a look at the website. 
We are also going to run competitions in different areas, including malware detection, autonomous driving, and robotics, and many others. Um, we have an open course on machine learning security. Every November, December, I'm lecturing, and then you find all the materials here. We have a library called Second Mail to run tests, attacks, and so on. And we have also um, security seminar lectures, similar to what you have here. We invite guests every month to give one lecture on these topics. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you uh, very much, Batista, for your very interesting talk.